compute. Okay. Right, well, welcome Andrew um, to UKBC, where budgies come first, um, live interview. Um, got a series of questions that we'll, we'll run through. Some are budgie, well, most of them are budgie related, but some aren't, because um, you've got uh, a passion that I, I love as well, and that's horticulture. So, um, you know, it'd be good to get to know a bit of the horticulture list that uh, you are, because... Uh, I believe you popped up on the telly the other day as well. Um, yeah, I'm country by a month ago, yeah, for, yeah, for work, I, yeah. I just caught the tail end of it, and um, I keep meaning to go back and watch it on uh, Catch Up, but uh, yeah. Okay, right. So, um, I've got a question here. It's all, um, when and how did you start in the hobby? Um, and, you know, did your dad, because obviously you're in partnership with your dad, um, did he have birds before you? Yeah, um, so dad had budgies from a beginner and got to champion status. Um, then he had four children, so I've got uh, three other brothers. Uh -huh. And then he found juggling budgies and four lads and, and businesses a bit, a bit too much. Um, so he, he sold and swapped all his birds for like, kids toys and all sorts of stuff oh, wow. um but the, the shed or the huge building we used to have them in remained um so then as i was getting older i started um buying kind of finches cockatiels ba basically anything as long as i paid for it and looked after it i could get yeah. whatever i want from sales rooms and I, I used to buy them from auctions and that kind of thing um and then uh, we moved house um, and I took all the finches and stuff with me. And then one day I came back from the sales room with some budgies. Um, and then kind of dad thought, well, if he's into budgies, we both might as well go back to budgies. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah why not? Yeah, so um, dad had paid um, his BS membership all the way through from not having budgies because his plan in his head, I think, was always to come back to them. Yeah. Um, so we came back, um, and we were, you're allowed to drop, um, a, a status, aren't you? When you come back, if you've been out a bit a while, yeah. um, but dad decided that we should stay as champions, um, which to be honest, the first couple of years was really, really difficult because we were, yeah, you know, we're showing against Pilkingtons, Hallams, yeah. um, Huxley and Marchants, all these people with, you know, the best, the best studs in the country at the time were probably in the Northwest. Um, and we as kind of complete beginners really, but, but in quality wise were, yeah. you know, getting absolutely mullered every week at the show scene. Yeah. I guess, I guess you couldn't just go back to your dad's quality of birds with, without endless money, I suppose, or, you know, deep pockets, should I say? No, we, st we started off with, with, you know, buying the odd bird from here, there and everywhere, like everyone else does. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then we bought a, a stud of birds from a guy, a local breeder called Harry Smithies, um, who kind of, he sold up for kind of health reasons and, and age. Yeah. Um, they were all Oakling cinnamons and Oaklings. Um, I think that was like 1992, maybe, something like that. Yeah. Um, and then we just added birds, a few birds here from there and everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really. Um, yeah, all, all our birds in up until about 2005, virtually the whole stud was Oakley and Cinnamon. Right. Oh, wow. Um, but but yeah. they were our best birds that, you know, we started, we yeah. started, um, in the late 90s, we started doing quite a bit of winning with them, winning lots of CCs. Um, so it it made sense to keep our best birds rather than, you know, yeah. sell them and buy birds of lesser quality, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. So so going back to sort of when when you start, I know you said you bought a stud, um, but was there any or any body that sort of really influenced you? Because like you've already said, you're in a in an area where there was quite a pool of champion mm. readers so is there anybody that you sort of lent on or learned from in your area not really because obviously dad had been in budgets for quite a number of years yeah um so he'd kind of been there and done it and i 
it got the gist if you breed cockatiels and finches and that kind of thing you're used to you know dealing with mite feeding birds uh, moving eggs feeding chicks and all that kind of thing it's it's all it's all very similar yeah. um you just hone your skills to budgies really um I, I think we we would kind of go to um the top breeders like pilkington's once or twice a year just to kind of I guess be blown away with like what what we're trying to aim for really. Um, you know, and for, like I said, for a couple of first few years, you know, we we were just every class we were losing. You know, at little local shows and small club shows, we did all right. Um, but um, yeah, as soon as you know you start seeing these birds are top breeders, if you're quite competitive, that's you want you you know you want to be beating them. And, yeah. and having birds coming second to them or third or, or getting in between when they've planted two or three really good birds. Um, so that, that, to be honest, took quite a while. It was kind of 2001, really, before we had major breakthroughs where we started winning regular besting shows um, and a lot more CCs in different colours. Yeah. Um, and then 2002, we won best, in, uh, best Opposite Sex and Best Opposite Sex Young Bird at the club show. Um, and then... Um, yeah, we, we realised our birds were getting to a, a much much better level. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so 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 you're sort of not quite at the top, but maybe getting there. So, what keeps you going? Um, 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 you know, what what's where's the enthusiasm come from? Do you and your dad bounce off each other or? Yeah, to be honest, the last oof, 10 years, we've just been, both of us are just budgie bonkers, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and we we just, the you know, the aim every year is to breed a better, a few better birds than we did last year. Um, and for like, about the last six, seven years, that's happened every year. Um, so our, our study in the last, I say, three, probably three years has moved like through the roof. There's birds like we were breeding three years ago and we think wow that's our best bird ever but now we probably might not be keeping it kind of thing it's it's just yeah. we um and then since i set up here two and a half years ago so this is my uh, second full season so kind of two and a half seasons in i guess um again the birds have gone through the roof um i i think because we concentrate on our best birds uh, we pair to get young ones off our best birds. Our, um, the way we look after our birds is, has changed a lot in the last five years. Um, the way we kind of, everything about the birds, into, you know, feeding's changed, um, how we house them, fans, all sorts of stuff. And I think yeah. our birds are healthier now than they've ever been. Um, and as a consequence, they breed better than they've ever done, kind of. Even though the, the quality is getting better, but the breeding results are getting is, is better as well. That's good because because sometimes you can lose one or the other, can't you? Better birds, but less chicks, or you know, it goes the wrong way sometimes, doesn't it? So yeah, we have okay. we have had we have had birds in the past. We bred super birds, and you've never you know you've never managed to get a chick off them. Um, and I, and I think that's because a while ago our our showing stroke breeding um level was different we were we were all about showing um and now we're all about breeding yeah um so we i think we you know we breed a super bird or a really good bird and we'd overshow it um it would go from the breeding cage to small stock cages so in effect it might you know go in the flight for a week or two a year so it's not yeah it's not exercising it's not getting better now you know then we wonder why they don't breed the following season yeah. and it's i think it's because we just keep them too enclosed um too much of the time and, and and don't let them kind of relax and chill out yeah yeah um, so that's that's changed completely in the last yeah. few years and also covid's really helped obviously with that because there was no show so no you know, no that's no, right flights not a problem yeah okay so i touched on it earlier that you're in the whole culture industry so can you just tell us, you know, a little bit about what you do as a job and, and where it takes you, really. 
Um, so currently I'm a, a head gardener for English Heritage, um, a property called Rest Park um, in Bedfordshire. Um, so I, well, I basically look after the whole team, uh, run a team and who look after the estate and we're trying to restore it to what it was um, kind of between 1750 and 1850 time wow. period. Um, before that, I've been there five years. Before that, I was at Q for 17 years. Um, which basically took me all over the world um, collecting plants from the wild. Um, and then I started towards the end of Q specialising in um, propagation of rare um, and kind of threatening the wild plants. Wow. Um, I'm not yeah. jealous at all, Mark. No, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> but the um, um, to be honest, I had living in London is just so expensive. So to get a house or a house or a flat or something with a garden enough to put, you know, a, a bird room in it is just unfeasible. So, yeah, um, yeah a few years ago, we made the um, move out to uh, Leighton Buzzard. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's close close for my partner to get uh, training to London and it's half an hour, 25 minutes to work for me. So it's, it's ideal, really. Yeah. And, this, and the restoration of the gardens and everything, is that... Um... Is that from sort of historic records or? Yeah, so it, it's putting it back virtually to exactly what was there in that time period. Uh, so we've got a lot of archives. We've got a, hist a history team that kind of work uh, off, off part of English heritage. Um, so it's kind of, a, it's a very unique site. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're trying to trying to get it, trying to get it back to what it was, which is a bit, a bit weird because like with budgies, we're trying to move forwards, aren't we? But with, with the plants, yeah. we're trying to move backwards. So it's yeah, yeah. That's right. no that's good it's good to know what you're doing actually because uh like i say if, if you google you um there is a lot about plants and history and all the rest of it so it's really interesting i i mean i i was um i started off in horticulture um but um i came out of it because there was no money i couldn't you know yeah. i just couldn't find a job that um gave me the money to support a family really so um yeah Okay, so what I was going to now do was I'm just going to sort of delve a little bit deeper into your birds and the bird rooms and how your dad do things. So how many cages have you got in each bird room? Um, so dad's got uh, 66 um, of the kind of, you know, the offspring of Trespa cages. Um, and then he's got one, two, th three kind of three quarter flights. And a very large, um, those kind of Ostringer three quarter flights that are on wheels, the trolley things. Oh, yeah. It's got yeah. one of those, um, and then a double trolley cage in there. Um, I've got 32 breeding cages, um, and like a double trolley cage as a flight. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, because your your bird room's not that old, is it really? Because we've watched it um sort of unfold on on facebook in a way haven't we? yeah so it's my my uh, mine mine's in the house um so literally i go from the kitchen open the door and i'm in the bird room um which uh, when we first did it i think i was really well i was reluctant to take half the garden over to make a bird room but also i was reluctant to have the bird in the house because of the well one i was thinking dust yeah. Um, and obviously seed, because there's seed all over the floor, isn't there, in most bird rooms. Um, so those were my two main concerns. But to be honest, it's the, it's brilliant. I love it. Um, and I've got um, so recently we've got I've got a five and a half month old daughter. Um, so now for looking after the baby, being in the birds, popping in and out is so easy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 perfect. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um... So, it, it, it may be a bit of a strange question, and but I believe you and your dad breed a very distinctive type of bird. I'd like to think I'd be able to walk into any show hall and go, that's a Luke bird, that's a Luke bird, especially some of the lace wings and things. So, have you, can you talk us through how you got to that? What maybe, what birds influenced your style and shape because your birds are very upright and a very I mean we were I was talking to someone last night and and you know your birds have back skull there is no two ways about it that is through your stud and they've got this lovely wide face with the feather coming 
forward but they're not and again don't take this the wrong way but they're not that modern flat-faced bird are they you know they're I don't know, they're very 3D almost, your birds. There are, there, I would say they're a mix. Um, we've got, ultimately, the, you know, the, the dream is to win the club show. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I believe the only way of doing that is to do it with a super stylish budgie, yeah. um, which has got, you know, it's got to stand there, blow its head off and be feather fit. Um, and we do have, you know, a good number of birds are these are, are big, ugly things. There's stock birds, you know, some are yeah. flex, some aren't, but they're too big and ugly. You know, they are, they are wow birds. People, I had a guy here a couple of nights ago and he was like, wow, 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 looking at that bird. And I, and I was like, yeah, but for a show, yeah, it's not going to win, it's, is it? It's not, it, it's, you know, we might have a massive head on it and whatnot, but it's, it's too untidy and disproportionate for what we're trying to get. But I, I believe you need those to mix in with your super stylish birds. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, 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 you know, 10 years ago, we were trying to breed a stud that all looked the same. All the, all the birds, you, like you said, you can walk into a, a room and just pick out our birds. Yeah. I think in the last three years, they've, they've completely altered. Um, so I think now there's, there's birds that I... I breed here and send to Dallas Barheads, and then I see them eight months later, and I can't believe that there are birds. Yeah. Um, and, and vice versa, because um, we've just, I, I guess we've added a few different features um, to them, and, we, and we're not, as I say, we're trying to make a mixture of, of types of bird now, so then we've got more pairing options. Uh, yeah. I, think, I think if you um, fix too many, features, too many features that are the same, you, you only can breed the same. Yeah. So yeah, you know, if, you, if you breed, a, you know, breed the best in show bird today, and then you think that's my aim is to breed a shed full of birds like that. By the time you've done it, everyone else has moved past you because you're, yeah. you're breeding a bird that, you know, looks, looks like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think I saw one of your lace wings the other day on Facebook and that was very different to your, mm. what I would call normal birds. And I think, I don't know your your um, profile picture as well. Is, is that a cinnamon grey? Oh, they're not. Yes, yeah, a normal grey on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. That again, that's very different. So, is that is that bird a youngster or is it? A... That bird is no. He's he's yeah. He's a youngster. He's he's gone and died now. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. He is. So he is a, a normal grey cop, which we won quite a few best in shows with. So he must be. I think an eight 2018 right. bird, red bird. Um, and then he, so he's the father of all this, of, um, kind of what I'm doing now with the cinnamon greys. Yeah. Um, so he, he's the father um, to a very good cinnamon grey cock that I bred, that dad bred, uh, must have been 2019. Um, and then I had him here the year before last. Um, he, didn't, he didn't breed at all in the first year. Um, yeah. and then I, and then I brought him here, uh, and then he bred like hell. Um, and I had him to about six, seven hens in one season, um, and got offspring and babies off all of them. And then that's kind of, that's where that kind of cinnamon stuff yeah. has come from that gray cock. Um, but he's, 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 you know, he's, he's basically our opening cinnamon line from years ago. Um, we did get, um, quite a few birds from Malkington um, in 2008, uh, 2010 and 2012. Um, and then since then we've had it, we've had the odd bird here and there. Um, currently we've got no birds with other people's rings on in the stud. Um, right. The last one went, um, we had a, a bird, I, I, um, Ian Ainley, um, I bought a bird off him, uh, a normal grey, which was the son of um, his best in show winning grey. Um, and I had that for maybe 18 months, something like that. Yeah. Uh, got loads of chicks off it. Um, and it's, I think it was a 2019 rung bird. Um, so I thought enough's enough. And also, um, when you physically look at the bird, it's not as good as the rest of our birds. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I was kind of keeping it for the last six months because it was an outcross and different than our birds. Um, but we've got, I've got a lot of it. Um, in fact, now dad's got all the offspring from last year at his house. So he's breeding off, you know, the birds that, that bred in, yeah. in effect. It was um, obviously a pretty, very potent or pretty potent bird, was it? The Amy Yeah, bird. it, 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 it was it, it was a very nice it was a nice bird it had it had everything just not enough of anything if that makes sense yeah yeah um but i was i was just whacking it to a big ugly hen so and it was and i said it was it was like one of these birds that virtually fills every egg yeah um so it was you know really pre, um you know really fertile um so I, you know so i so i risked it with you know quite a lot of the big kind of ugly hens that you think will they will they not breed kind of thing yeah yeah um, yeah yeah no that's good because i mean i'm starting to get into the realms of a few bigger hens and things and uh funny enough one of them has got some um, full eggs tonight so but it is like the fifth egg but you know it's a start so um sort of listening to what you're saying it, it's quite quite refreshing you know um okay so um what improvements would you like to see in your birds and what are you working on at the moment? So maybe an individual feature or? Um, I guess trying to restyle some, quite a lot of the ugly ones. Um, which, well, it's, it's weird. I've, I've, here I've gone more ugly this year and dad's gone more stylish. Right. Um, so as a consequence, you know, three quarters of my birds will go to dad's and a few will come up this way um, to, to mix it. Because I don't want to pair ugly to ugly. No, um, I mean, is, is that because the birds you just ended up with or did you, you and your dad consciously sort of say, right, OK, there's a batch that you, you take? Was, was it thought through that? And, or did it just end up that way? Um, no, the, the first year when I, when I, so I built the bird room here and paired up, oh, I think February, March time, that, that the first year. So I, I took all the older birds, the, old, the older cock birds from, from dad's um, and, and the, quite a few kind of young hens and then some of the current year hens um, because we were a bit, when you, when you build a new bird room, you don't know whether the birds are going to breed in it. No. And that, it's, and almost that, like a, it's almost like a new bird syndrome, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so I, I didn't want to bring any of the top, say, 30 birds here yeah. until I got around the two going and found and, and seen what the bird room did. Um, when, I, when I first started up, the it was too quiet. The birds were too quiet. Um, they bred okay. Um, but I, I just believe I, I, I basically I think brought fifteen about fifteen pairs and there was about uh, five or six in the flight um, yeah. and, I, and I think because obviously those birds had come out of a bird room with four hundred birds in it they were used to noise um, so I don't I, I think now they're enjoying it more because I've got a lot more birds um because you know they're sociable aren't they they, they need yeah, noise sure. they need stimulation that kind of thing yeah. um yeah. so i so i think that was my biggest mistake wasn't it? i should maybe i should have brought um 20 30 sales birds and thrown them in the flight kind of thing um yeah. just to make a bit of noise um yeah. i didn't i didn't want to bring too many birds because obviously dad dad was breeding with um He's got the 44 cages on the back wall and then there's 12 on the other wall, but he only breeds off about four or five cages of them. So I, we didn't want to go from a stud of that size and add another 30 pairs overnight, if that makes sense, yeah. and, breed off, and breed off inferior birds because I just don't see the point. No, um, no, you know, right. number, you know, cop number 90 is unlikely to breed better than cop number 30, is it? So better in quality. No, that's right. Um, yeah. So that's why we went for, you know, 15 of the older birds. Um, and then the following year, we, obviously I bred some and he bred some, so we had a lot more to choose from. And we had a, and we had a really good season, both of us. Um, so now we've got more, a lot more birds to, to kind of choose from. Uh, we, do, we do have a kind of rule that when dad comes here, he can take whatever he wants back to his aviary and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, we, t we tend to leave the best hens where, wherever they were born. Right. Um, yeah, keep them settled. Yeah, we try and do that. Um, 
the only, the, we, we feed quite differently um, oh, right. oh, than what we feed. And also I've gone on the, over onto an automatic water system. Yes, um, that's right. Which is that. fine. Yeah, which is fine when I give birds to dad because they'll find those, you know, the, the normal drinkers really easily. But when I get birds from dad, it takes a while to, for them to yeah. find it. I've got to, I've got to put add, add normal drinkers again for a, a period of time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I I, t I use a mixture of fountain and uh, rabbit ball drinkers, um, and I have to teach the babies to use the ball drinkers, you know, before I even put them near the flight. So, um, yeah, I know where you're coming from that. So, so um, I've got a question here. Where, have you got an image in your mind of your perfect bird? But I'm not sure a perfect bird really exists. But is there somebody's bird out there that you're using as an example or have you got clear defined idea in your own mind of what you're aiming for yeah i've got one in my head <laughs> I've got, I've, and i think i um and I, I i think the pieces are here now in the a in the a between the two of us i think you know i've got a super um uh, cinnamon spangle a baby this year which is unbelievable blow on it it's got head whip it's got everything um but being a cinnamon spangle it it probably won't do that well it shows if that makes sense because it'll yeah, get it'll yeah. get not for being not lighter markings even though it's supposed to be lighter markings um and then i want to pair that that line into our gray greens which have got a lot more kind of directional feathering that comes straight out yeah um, and then mix that at the same time with our cinnamon grey line. Um, yeah. They're all they're all related, but it's just some are a lot closer than others. So it, it wouldn't be out crossing, but it wouldn't be pairing close if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to shut my dog up. Henry, come here. <laughs> so I've got I've got a dog that doesn't like the neighbour's lawnmower. Um, I'm just going to. Right. Come here. Come here. He's um yeah untrainable, I think the word is for him. Untrainable. Ah, right. So um, so yeah, I was, I was just gonna touch on the lace wings and things actually. So I know you said they're sort of related, but are the lace wings a separate family or a line, or you've just got them all mixed? Because I know you've got spangles that are split lace wing, haven't you? I think yeah. The, the, um, when we first got lace wings in 2008 from South Africa, we got three three visual cocks, a split cock, and a hen, a visual a visual hen. The two of the lace wing cocks were brothers, and the sis and the sister was the hen. Um, so we had quite a close family to go with. Anyway, we we paired the opening cinnamon that was split lace wing to the lace wing hen. Um, and they bred all rubbish, so they all went. Um, and then the lace wing cocks we paired to our um, opening cinnamon hens. Um, and then we got, you know, some visual straight away, but mainly a lot of splits. Um, and then for the first uh, four or five years, we kept pairing them into the, into the opening cinnamons. Because um, that, that was our, you know, that's where all our birds come from. So that was our strongest line. Yeah. Um, and we have and we had loads of opening cinnamon hens at the time. Um, now we we pair them into anything. Uh, so but we very rare, rarely do we pair lace wing to lace wing. Right. Um, I've got I've got a pair here down here only because the hen. Um, it's a it's a super super um, yellow hen, but it won't go with a non lace wing. It won't oh, pair up with a non lace wing, so I'm stuck with a, a parent to a lace wing, which I don't ideally want to do. Um, but yeah, so now I, I paired um, spangles into them a few years ago. A lot, a lot of normal cinnamons we put into them. Um, I haven't put pies into them because we don't have many pies. I haven't, I haven't put yellow faces into them. But it, it's, I just look at the bird rather than I'm not too bothered about the colour or the variety yeah. to be honest. That, funny enough um, that was going to be my next question actually with your lace wings and that because I've, I've had some really good dilutes it was one of my first cc's and and I decided then that I was going to treat it as a bird not a variety um, and I ended up breeding some of my best birds are from that line so you're obviously doing a very similar thing. 
Yeah, we, we, we will keep whatever the best birds are. So if if when we at the end of the you know the end of the season, which seems to last forever nowadays, um, we'll cut down dad's birds, say to 80, 90 cocks, and it'd be it's purely visual. Yeah. So colour won't even come into it. So if, if a lace wing cock didn't come into that top 90, then we wouldn't keep any lace wing cocks. Yeah. Um, and the same with the hens, but we keep twice as many hens. Um, but but now I, I think some of our lace wings look like that, you know, they look the same as the normals. They're getting that yeah. width of hairs, this shape, the spot which came from Mulkington. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm not I'm not too worried. Like in the first from kind of when I paired up in September to about a month ago, I hardly bred any lace wings here. Um, Cause I'd paired all the, I paired all split cocks to lace wing hens and lace wing cocks to non lace wing hens. Yeah. So hardly any visuals came out, but I wasn't, I'm not bothered because I've got loads of no. um, late breads from last year that are visual lace wings. Um, so it's one of those things that if, if, if I was worried, I could just bear lace wing to lace wing and they'll pop, you know what I mean? They'll pop out again, but I'd rather try and breed a better one by, by putting it, by, you know, putting the normal qualities of normal birds into them. I just let the lace wings pop out. Yeah. Lo loads of, you know, mo most birds we've got in the shed will be split Oakley and cinnamon and probably about a quarter of the cock birds now will be split lace wing. Um, and oft, often because we'll we'll breed off split cocks to non non lace wing hens as well if they're good enough, and then you know the young ones the cocks might be split lace wing they might not you never know until you pair them up no, and lace wing pots no. out. Um, yeah. So now you know it's and also I, I feel you breed better lace wings and better enos in general the less eno you've got in the pairing if that makes sense visually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because a few years ago, we bred a, a super, super Lutino hen out of a grey green cock and a, um, a cinnamon grey, purely by luck. Yeah. Um, but it was a super bird. Um, it won CCs at the club show. It won quite a lot of best opposite sexes, that kind of thing. And then last year, I bred a really, really good uh, Lutino cock off a um, spangle split, cinnamon split lace wing and a lace wing hen. Um, it's a stunning, stunning cock. So now, but I don't, we don't really want to go into Lutino. So now we've paired it to a lace wing to try and get more lace wings, if right. that makes sense. Because it could, you know, because it is, it's out of the lace wing line and it's just, and it is a really good bird. So yeah, I don't, I don't want to go down the Lutino route, really. No, no. Not that, I, not that I don't like Lutinos. I think we've just got enough varieties with what we're, what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. So have you ever, been overseas and have you ever bought any birds back we obviously we went to, we went to Malkington's quite a few times um we have swapped some birds with some european breeders um but i've never um oh yeah um, yeah i've been to joe manny's um back in 2002 2003 i think it was um, on a on a coach load, it was on a on a you know oh, a coach right. visit. It was, it was it was a strange experience. Um, it, it literally was people just throwing money, like you know like I've got yeah. people just thinking I've got three hundred quid in my pocket or whatever the money I have to spend it, and they weren't. I don't think really they were looking at what bird they were buying. It just it was it was just a ring code. Um, and there was only on the coach, I think there was us and another person that didn't come back with a bird. Yeah. Um, only because the birds, um, you know, Joe had super birds at the time, but the birds that he had for sale, we didn't feel would help us no. progress. So, no. we, you know, we're not, we're not just going to buy a bird just because we're at someone's house kind no. of thing. No, that's right. No. What, sort of, um, what sort of impact on your stud did the... Uh, Malkington birds have on yours? Um, re really quick impact. Um, it was funny when we paired we paired um, some Malkington to Malkington because we did get a, we did get a few hens, but we got predominantly cocks. Um, but weirdly, the ones when we paired Malkington to our lines produced first generation better chicks than Malkington to Malkington. Um, which you wouldn't you wouldn't expect that because no um, and that and that's one of the reasons why we bought some hens because we thought well if if the lines don't click 
then at least we can pair Malkington to Malkington and kind of start a new, a completely new line, if that makes sense. Um, but it, yeah, at the time he had, he had super birds. Um, depth of mask and spot was unbelievable. Um, lace wings that you'd never seen before. I've never seen quality like that. Same with Lutinos. Um, and that's why we came back with some lace wings the, the third time. It was like, we can't not come back with them because they look like, you know, they were the same quality as the normals. Yeah, um, yeah. I can quite imagine. So I, I think probably Rhino has probably had the most influence on our stud out of any individual, I would say, apart from obviously myself and my dad. Um, yeah. Purely because of the amount of time when I was over in South Africa, we spent with him looking at... Um, his feeding regimes, how he looks after the birds, all that, all that kind of stuff that people aren't really often in the UK aren't really kind of willing to share, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so but, that that had that had just as big an influence on you and your dad than the birds, as you know. Yeah, the, the, to be honest, bird. Um, we I first went there in two thousand and four uh, in two thousand and four to Rhine Arts because um, I was it was I was in South Africa on a work trip. Um, and I'd seen birds of his at Gerald's, Binks's. Um, so I went and I stayed with him for a few days. We couldn't, we, at the time, I think there was um, avian flu or something in South Africa, so you couldn't, you couldn't export birds. Um, but straight away when I came home, our feeding regime changed straight away. Well, I say it changed straight away. The mentality changed straight away. But we, we, we started feeding a lot more vegetables, but we introduced it slowly over like a, kind of a two-month period. Um, yeah. Because before that, we were just feeding basic seed, um, say, uh, what is it called? Cytocon? Say, Cytocon or? Cytocon and um, um, Abbey Deck in the water, okay. grit, minerals, cuttlefish, a few millet sprays, and plain seed. That, and that was it. Yeah. Um, and um, EMP, which the birds didn't, some of them ate it, some no. of them didn't. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, then I went there, and it was, to be honest, it was the health. Probably still to this day is the healthiest stud of birds I've ever seen. Um, in terms of birds, super birds that can fly, um, how they're looked after, the, the amount of variety of food they get. Um, you know, it's, it's like a five star hotel for them, really, living there. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and they get, they, I guess they get what we don't have is they got the weather, you know, so he's got the weather to have all his windows open all, virtually all year round. They get a lot of sunlight. They get everything. So it's yeah, it's it's kind of, I guess, apart from Australia, it's probably the ideal place to breed budgets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. It's good. I've only ever seen pictures of his setup. So, <laughs> uh, you yeah, you, you can't. It's huge. You just get lost in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let's stay with the feeding then. Um, can you just literally because I know you do. Um, and it, it was talked about Kevin um, on his Facebook chat a minute ago um, before this spoke about how you sprout seed and everything. So, um, yeah, just run us through your um, feeding regime and, and just, so, you know, and perhaps touch on the differences between you and your dad. Um, I, I guess I, I use a lot of um, the Fraser's products. Um I did, I did, when I first started the birds here, use a very well-known person's mixture of supplements. Um, but to be honest, the, they, did, they made no difference at all. So um, they were very, they're very expensive for what I was getting out of it. So um, I then switched. Um, so my, my feeding, we, all, we both use Johnson & Jeff seed. Um, so dad gets it delivered like a ton at a time because we use a lot of seed. Um, he buys it all um, straight, um, except tonic seeds. So we have a, he has his own kind of mix. Um, it's basically a mix of canary, red millet, white millet, um, yellow millet, a bit of panicking in there, um, Japanese millet a little bit, and then um, a tonic seed just mixed. And the whole lot just goes in one dish, basically. Um, and then he feeds a soft food that is very similar to what uh, Richard and Michael Miller feed. Oh, right. Yes. Um, so it's a lot of kind of um, the, the um, NAF, a lot of the NAF products, a lot of vegetables, a lot of um, uh, soft food, it's a couple of different types of branded soft food. Um, I'm trying to think of what's in it now. It's that long since I've 
fed them, but um, I can't quite remember. So yeah, very very similar to what the Millers use uh, yeah. feed wise, uh, and, and he's, he's really happy with that. He gets, he's you know ever since we started using that, he's, we've had really good results. Yeah. Um, so my, my reason for not using it is is purely speed. Um, yeah. I've got yeah. a, lot, a lot less time um, on my on my hands than than Dad has these days. Cause he, you know he's retired. Um, he can you know that Dad loves you know the feeding, water inside the hobby, and being in the bird room. He absolutely loves it because while he's doing that, he's he's got pairings going on in his head. He's checking checking the nest. He's doing all sorts. Um, whereas for me, it's as soon as I get home from work, I want to be in the birds straight away to look for chicks that, that might not have been fed, that kind of thing. Um, I so I feed um, the same kind of seed mix as dad. Um, I feed the birds every other day. Um, so I have these like large um, trays that those you know, the people that use um, cut flowers have those kind of green blocks they look like bricks but are green yes, yeah, oasis, the, oasis the, yeah. the little trays that they sit in is what i use in each breeding cage um so i know i put enough food in um to last the birds um kind of two and a half days um yeah. even though i change it every other day um so the ones obviously that are feeding young ones get three scoops of what my mix and then the ones that are not feeding anything just get one scoop so it's quite quick I put all the soft food straight on top. So again, I feed soft food every other day. Um, I guess the thing was, I, I probably feed a lot more soft food than my dad, even though I feed it every other day. Right. I kind of I mound it on. I put loads on. Yeah. Um, and they they love it. I think the um, the germinated veg um, germinated seeds they just go mad for it. Yeah. Um, as soon as I feed all the birds straight down, um, eating eating the soft food. Um, so I, I feed a probably about a pint and a half when when the when the mix when the when the sprouted seed mix is dry it's probably about a pint and a half um, sorry a liter and a half um, container um, and then I, I soak that overnight oh sorry twenty four hours in in water um, and then I've got these little trays that, that I then then tip that into it. Um, rinse it once a day under the tap, and then on day four, um, it's ready to go in the soft food. So it's yeah. about, well, I don't know, a centimetre, two centimetres sprouted. Yeah, because you came away from the automatic sprouter as such, didn't you, and onto those probably Yeah, it, it, I, I bought it, and it was really quick and really easy, but the liquid in the bottom just stank. Yeah. Um, even though I was changing the, liquid, the, well, the water every day in it, but it, it just stank, and I thought, well, if that's just been sprayed over the seed all the time, even though I was rin I rinsed it before I you you know gave it the birds, I just thought, well, I rather not. And actually, weirdly, that it had um, the automatic sprout had a heating element in it as well, so it, it, you could choose three different heats on it. Anyway, since I've gone over and just and it's it used to live in the kitchen, and I, I now have these two sprouted seed things there, and it actually germinates. Better without the automated sprouter, which is, wow. weird, which is weird. I thought I was kind yeah. of thinking it'll take longer, but it's actually um, so. Since I got rid of the automatic sprouter, I've doubled the amount of seed I give uh, sprouted seed I give them every day because the trays yeah. are bigger. And you um, find just rinsing it once a day, it's it's okay, is it? You know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I don't, if 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 people see fungus or things like that growing in, I, I then I chuck the whole lot and, and miss yeah. it for that day. But yeah, touch wood, I haven't had that. Problem. I, I give it a you know rinse straight under the tap. Yeah. Um, it's in the it's in these um, so these green trays with like a white tray in them, but it's like a sieve. It sits in like a sieve if that makes sense. Yeah. You don't you don't tip it out. You just lift the tray the, the inner tray out yeah. and put that under the tap. Oh. Um, and and then um, I yeah at, at the end of that cycle, which will be four days, I guess, for that that one individual tray. I whack that in the dishwasher just to clean it before I put the next seed in the next day. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm quite obsessed with the dishwasher. Um, yes. The nest box is going there between rounds. Um, all my feeding um, dishes, all that stuff, perches, everything, chick hides, it all goes in the dishwasher. Yeah. 
Um, well, you wouldn't do it without you would you do it with your plates and your bowls, so you know why I not? don't do it at the same time as the plates and the bowls. Well, no, I'm I, sure I, you I, don't. I've got a separate cycle. Um <laughs> that's that's the deal of being able to use the dishwasher in the house. So um yeah. 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 So um so what about supplements? What sort of supplements do you obviously you said your dad does the yeah, so I, I use um oh, I'm trying to think. So I use Fraser form. Um, I use Fraser's Ultra Grit. I use oh, it's another Fraser product called Molly Sonic's quite a new thing. Um, oh, right. okay, it's a mixture of all sorts of minerals. Um I use um, calcium carbonate, I add. Um I use um uh garbo uh layers oh, yeah, mash. Yeah. yeah that's layers mash. I um i use a soft food um deli nature the one with the um yeah. shrimps in it um i add dried mealworms uh, uh dried um herbs mainly alpha alpha it's like a bait and it's like a bale and it comes like it looks like straw um and then i put it through the food processor to make it more kind of manageable uh, they get that. Uh, they were getting 30 bit in that mix, but I, for the last six months, I've just, I ran out and then I've just not got it again and there's no yeah. difference. Um, oh, um, mag is it, it's called Magic? The, um, pink, yeah. pink Powder. Pink Powder. Yeah, that's one of the ones, I think, isn't it? One of the uh, They get a small amount of that. Uh, and then I give uh, 16 in one oil. Uh, so this is all this is all mixed together in a bucket. Sixteen in one oil, uh, cod liver oil, um, a Fraser's thing. Called, I think it's called a Amino Vit. Yeah, I've seen uh, that. That's liquid as well. Yeah, it's not, it's like um, it's more like a gunk, like a brown gunk that stinks. Um, <laughs> they like they seem to like it. Um, and what else? There's something else I put in a wheat, a wheat germ, a wheat germ oil. Um, and then I get uh, put frozen sweet corn in it, and then three, four different vegetables just through the like. Um, so I've got a food processor, so I use a full processor's worth of food, uh, vegetables, right? In it, so I end up with um, three by the time the whole lot's mixed together, and then this the sprouted tea goes in, I end up with three quarters of a like builder's bucket amount, yeah. Um, but like you so said, you're only giving that every other day, aren't you? But in good quantity yeah i give them i give them a, a, a lot of it and they they eat the whole lot they eat, it's yeah. just gone um yeah yeah very good very good okay so let me just shuffle my paperwork around here okay so so back to the sort of the breeding um side of things um do you do you always find you need to pluck or trim the vents of your birds we, we, yeah, we, we pluck them by habit now. Um, so when we when we pair, we when when the, all the birds were in one room, when we was just dad, breed, where, you know, they were all at dads. Um, I would go down at the start of the year, we we pair up together. Um, but then since we've kind of got a separate bird room, dad pairs his up, I pair mine up, but we chat about pairings on the phone on my way home every day, kind of thing. Um, so um we yeah we pair up and then about four or five days after the pair have gone together we'll then pluck both at the hen and the cock um and then also if we try and do it between rounds as well so as soon as young ones are about to come out of the nest box yeah we'll, we'll pluck their cock and hen again um, do you restrict the access to the nest box as well for a few days or um when we originally pair up at the start of the season, we do for about three days. We just put in like we got like a little plastic thing that just slides yeah. in the in the back of the concave. Um, so we do then. I I don't a lot here. I do I do when I originally pair up, but here I um, I guess if if a pair produce chicks and they're not like if there's four chicks in the nest, and I think well I'm not going to keep any of them. Then I don't. I won't let them go down again. So I'll whip the cock out, and then a day as soon as the chicks come away, I'll put a different cock in. Um, so I, I can't really lock off the nest box because often sometimes you find they lay on the floor and that kind of thing. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I've, I've, I've got less, I guess, less patience. I don't, I just don't like breeding birds that I don't want to breed from, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. no my, my views on those are changing quite rapidly now. Um, I think once you start breeding, I mean, I've always bred one or two good birds, but now I'm sort of getting them numbers. Um, you do, you, you start looking at the cock birds and you think, why am I pairing that up? <laughs> you know, but all of a sudden I'd rather, I mean, I run 20 cages, so I'd rather pair maybe 16 good pairs and just leave the others empty. You know, I, really not, not about numbers anymore. So, yeah. Um, and I know you, you said you haven't got many birds with your own, um, or sorry, with other people's rings on, but is it getting to the stage where you've started to think about an outcross or are you always looking for that opportunity? Well, no, we're always, we're always looking. Um, and I, I guess the main, I guess some of the main reasons we haven't, we haven't got any at the moment is because like I said, I had this bird off Ian um, Ainley. I also bought a Spangle, um, Spangle Grey off another breeder whose name I forget which had a, um, a Scott Amy ring on it. Um, and I bought that oh, the year before last, I think. Um, and then I bred off that, and it, it popped out of, um, an albino in the first round. Um, and then talking to Ian, he said, oh, it might be split albino. I was like, no, it is split albino, because it, it's bred one. Um, I bred a nice one as well, so it was, it was you know, any, any, I'm not bothered what colour they are, as long as, as, long as I want to keep them. Um, we had, before that, we had a, um, what did very well for us is uh, Mike Ball gave, gave me a um, cobalt cock with a hockaday ring on it. Um, so obviously Mike got all um, Harry's birds yeah. um, and he sent, he sent down this cock bird. And that, I, I bred loads off that, absolutely loads off it. It, it died, it's dead now. Um, but, it, it, you know, I've got two or three sons paired up here, two or three daughters are at dad's house and, and we're on with the kind of, grandchildren of those those birds now um so it's not yeah it's not and also i think because of covid obviously we couldn't visit breeders um and there was no show so you couldn't really see who's got the best you who's got good no. you know who's got birds and who hasn't i don't really like buying birds from photographs no um unless unless it's from a stud that i've, I've been to a few times or we or we know um so for example the the Ainley cock was from a photograph um because we, we know him very well uh, we know he's got super birds we know he's very fussy with what he breeds from um and, and he sent me a pictures or video of its relatives and that kind of thing so it was quite an easy easy thing to do um so yeah i'd rather go somewhere and look for a bird with the feature that we want to add to our birds yeah um, and, and see the um, like the overall studies, what I'm looking at, you know, yeah, the, the yeah. first, you know if, if you go to a person, they've got two super, super birds and then the rest of them are average, yeah. unless you buy one of those two super birds or an offspring, you're not going to progress. No, um, so, we'll, we, you know, if, we're, if we think, I don't know, you know, if, say we thought our, our birds are lacking spot at the moment, for example, they're not, but if they were, yeah. We'd go to a stud that's it, it stamped through the whole lot of them. Yeah. You know, and, and buy a bear with a spot. It might have a slightly narrower head or smaller than what we've got at home, but we're going for a feature. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we might look at buying two or three birds from the same the same line to then try and fix it quicker, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like I said earlier, you know, if somebody wants back skull in their birds, then the loop birds are the ones to go for, you know, because every bird you put up has that you know uh, i think show birds have to have it um yeah. so as a consequence it ends up being in the stock birds because they're all, all the lines are the same aren't they they're all mixed yeah. up so yeah um yeah. it's just in them and your your pairing up methods whether it's different between you and your dad do you let birds choose their partners or do you separate before so you break any bonds um both. <laughs> um, um, I, I think I think I probably start looking to breed off birds at a younger age than my dad does, especially the, probably more so the cock birds. 
we, we try and leave the hens for until they're at least 10 months old. Uh, we have, and we are, you know, and successfully, we have bred off hens that are eight months old. Um, but it's not something we like to, we, we generally have had success, but then the second year we haven't had success with the same hen. Um, so we, we tend to breed off young hens. We tend to pair them up and just have to take two rounds of eggs off them, then split them up and say, we, can't, we say putting them on the shelf for next year kind of thing. Um, so I, I will, we will split cocks and hens up about a month before we thinking of pairing up. Um, which for us, our, our main season is normally kind of mid-September, our birds are bouncing. So kind of middle of August, we split them up and then just wait for the kind of noise to come and we know they're ready to go. Um, uh, and, that, and that's just, we just split up the birds that are old enough to breed off in that first round. So they're kind of late breads um, will still be in a flight, mixed cocks and ends. Yeah. Um, so they're kind of learning what to do. Um, last year, I, I paired a bird up that was eight month old, no, seven, seven month old cock bird to a hen that was about eight months old. Um, only, be, and it was, a, it was a bit by accident, really. They, they paired up in the flight. Um, and, I, and I was thinking, and every day I saw this, it's a super cinnamon, and I saw him mating this hen every, like virtually every time I went in the he's always mating that, that hen. And then after it went on and on for about a month, and then I thought, I saw the hen and she was in the corner one day and I thought, oh, she's going to bloody lay. Um, so I opened the knot and I thought, well, she's going to lay regardless of whether I put her in a breeding cage or not. So I might as well put her in a breeding cage. And I put both the two, the pair in the breeding cage. Um, and I got four super babies straight away yeah. that first round. Um, which are, the, which are the cinnamon greys that I'm messing about with now. Um, so I think the birds tell us when they're ready rather than us. In the past, we would um, rush the birds. We'd think, oh, we're pairing up on X date for the rings and the birds have to be ready. You whack them all down. Some breed, some don't. Not in condition. Some are, some aren't. Now we wait for the birds. Um, and we're not, to be honest, we're not bothered about the ring issue date and, and breeding, but waiting for that. Um, for us, September, October, our birds breed really well. And kind of February, March time, they breed, breed really well. The summer, in the kind of December, January, we seem to get a, 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 a bit of a lull. They don't stop breeding. They don't like mess about, but I think... I just don't, I think maybe the birds, I don't know, they can tell by the weather outside or something. They, they know what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's, that is quite true. So, okay. And how closely do you pair your birds? Do you, you know, we, we've talked about family lines and that, but it realistically is cousin to cousin the closest you go or do you not even get that close um I, I, we don't we used to when we first started um and we started bringing a few you know at the time when we only had a couple of good birds we would breed some birds half brother and half sisters and uncles to nephews that kind of thing to, to try and fit well when we were trying to fix features um and then now, and at that time, I guess 10 years ago, we had distinct almost colour lines. So we had a cinnamon line, we had a yellow face line, we had a oak clean cinnamon line, which was mixed with lace wings. And then we had a um, kind of spangle normal line. Uh, now they're all mixed together. The whole lot are just... And I think, I think that's made the difference in the quality of our birds. I think we've... We've had the lines where we fixed the nice blow, and then we've had lines where we fixed the nice width, and then when we've mixed them together, some have come out with both, and some have come out with one or the other. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't like. I used to like the half brother and half sister idea, but now I, I, I think it's the kind of means to an end. Really, I think if we were still doing that now, our facility would just drop overnight. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, bird, it's just not good for bird health, is it? You know, we, we, want, we want birds, and I, I keep, you know, I, I was a, had a couple of people here the other night, and, you know, I, I want to be still breeding 
super quality exhibition budgets in 20, 30 years' time, or as you know, until I cark it basically. Yeah. Um, and if we're breeding half of and half sister for 10 generations, you ain't you ain't gonna be doing that. No, no. You know. So so when you're pairing, then do, do you get the stud book out and start looking at who's who? Yeah, so we, we, we pair purely visually now. So we pair the bird, we, we put the, we, I will, or it, the way we used to do it with me, me and dad, say two and a half, three years ago, we'd get our top 10, 15 cock birds out, put them all in show cages, and then we would go to the flights and find the right two hens for each bird. Right. And then we would look at the um, records to see if they were related or not and then some hens would go out if they were too, if we felt they were too close um and then we did it so we each cock had two hens obviously it went to the fittest hen at the time and then two month you know two rounds later then go to the second hen in theory um and we basically just concentrated on the top end of the birds you know the top birds yeah um and we were fortunate that i guess the last four or five years all our best birds have bred for us um, so it means that, you know, instead of having one one or two good birds, you've then, if they breed for you and breed the same quality, you've then got six birds and eight birds the next year. It's, it, it multiplies pretty quick. Yeah. Um, took me took me a while to um, click on to that thinking. Really, yeah. Really, really. We, we don't, um, we don't pair best to best with young cock birds. So we, and we rarely, rarely at the start of the season do we pair young birds to young birds. So we go for, a, you know, a, one of, maybe, you know, our best, say our best cop young bird we breed this year will go to a hen that, that bred this year, if that makes sense. Right. So we know that in every, every pair we pair up at the start of the year, at least one of them knows what they're doing because <laughs> they've yeah. bred before yeah. but, you know so whether it's the cock that's been fertile before or the hen that's bred before at least one of them will will yeah. know what they're doing i think i think that's why i'm ending up with my some of my best young birds have gone together this year and i think that's why i'm getting the fifth and sixth egg fertile and not yeah. not the first four you know um but uh yeah we, we um, also um if they clear the first round we change the pairing Oh right! Oh, that's we don't we don't think oh they'll suddenly magically know what they're doing. No. We'll let them go again. We we split them up. We used to until about four years ago. Um, and do you do you ever try that same pair again later? Some, on? Yeah, sometimes maybe it might be a year later right. because 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 it, at the time that was like our ideal pairing in our heads. Yeah. So we still want to do it, but we think well. You've just done it with a round and you've got you've got nothing, not even a fertile egg. So one of them or both of them don't click. Yeah. Or they're not breeding. You know, there's there's many reasons, isn't there? Sometimes the yeah. um I've got a few hens here that are super aggressive and they won't don't let the cocks near them. I've got some cocks that are super aggressive, and don't let the hens out of the boxes. So it's individual birds I'll chase out of the nest boxes twice a day and basically wait. 20 minutes, let them mate, and then chase them back in the, back in the nest box. Mm, um, yeah. So, diff yeah, different technique. It's, it's, the key is to get birds off your best birds. As soon as you start doing that, your, your birds get better quicker. Yeah, um, yeah. Good. Okay, so um, you're never shy of putting a flecked bird on Facebook, you know, it, 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 you know, and you, you've said, you know, some of your stock birds will be flecked. Mm -hmm. So what about incomplete birds? Do you completely shy away from them or do you sort of pick and choose what you use? Um, to be honest, I hate them. <laughs> I, 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 um, birds without tails and birds without wing, you know, parts of wings. I, they, I hate, I do hate them. Um, and it is it is really difficult when you breed a bird and it's a super bird or in your top ten cocks and it drops a, you know a tail at six months and things like that. I, we tend now in our we in our notes well in our pedigrees we keep um, records so anything that drops its flights we'll put next to that bird or wings and then we'll what then we'll keep an eye then if it is a super bird we'll think all right we'll breed off that see what the youngsters do 
Yeah. Um, and if the youngsters start messing around with flight problems or tail problems, then the youngsters go, and then the cotton bear goes as well. Um, because it, again, we don't we we're at a stage where I think where we've got enough birds that we can be more fussy. Yeah. With our, with our birds. Yeah, it's um, harder in a small stud of birds, isn't it? Much harder. Yeah, and also when you're when you when you don't have when you know when you're trying to build up your stud of birds it's a lot more tempting to buy a bird with a, you know, a cyst or something like that, because a lot of breeders will sell them because yeah. they don't want them. No, well, they've, they've got big heads yeah. on them kind of thing. So I, I, I think you've just got to be, I think you just need to keep notes with any fault that you have in birds. Um, obviously some things like flecking, it's visual, isn't it? You either see it or you don't. I always think do you, that. I was going to say, do you, do you that, that's quite interesting because, I've always, perhaps incorrectly, have always said to myself, if I breed a bird that's clean off of fleck, that, that's got fleck parents, it's going to be split for flecking. Yeah, we, we have that kind of philosophy that we, we try not to produce. If you produce a clean one off a fleck one, we try not to pair that baby one back to a fleck one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah. It, again, but then again, we never ever pair two fleck birds together. So it's, it, right. you know. Um, and I mean, your your birds are quite heavily feathered, anyway. But what about? I mean, the term we use is buff hens. Yeah. You know, do you spend time with trying those heavier feathered hens? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we 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 we. Are, I think we're better at dealing with them now than we used to be so because sometimes these really big buff almost ugly hens are potentially your best hen you breed that year if, if you're not looking at it show wise but you're looking at it as yeah. the potential to move your stud forwards then potentially if they've got whacking great big heads the big birds they've got a lot of feather they've got the potential to really speed up your progress yeah. In the past, we would think, oh, well, what's our best, you know, what's our best cock? Let's go to our best cock. And you get nothing. So now we'd think, oh, well, what's the best cock? Has he got a lesser brother? A lesser brother? There might be, you know, so it might be your biggest, most kind of big, ugly hen, but you're purring to your number kind of 40 cock rather than, your, rather than your top 10. Yeah. So yeah. if it doesn't breed, you haven't, in effect, wasted your best bird for a round or two rounds. Um, but I, and also, I think also with the bigger buffer hens, you you've got to really watch them for when they come into condition. You've got to pair them up. Yeah. Um, you you can't think, oh, I'll pair them up in two weeks' time. When they're ready to go, they need they need to go. Um, so again, we you know if, if you know I'm, I'm trying to wind down my season now, but I've got a couple of hens. I'm thinking. They're big and ugly and they haven't come into condition yet if they do come into condition i'll carry on breeding with a few pairs just to to, to let them let them do their yeah. thing yeah because um, if you if you leave them another six to eight months they've probably gone past it and that's the end of that isn't yeah, it? yeah and I, I think it's just it's just condition as soon as every, every bird comes into condition sooner or later some of them take seven months from birth some of them take two years and it's just yeah. waiting for them to to do it you know, well, I, I think I, people rush. I think that's the problem. People rush. Yeah. I mean, I got caught out once because I was waiting for hens to see us to turn brown. Um, and this particular, I get quite a few in a particular line that never go brown. They're just, yeah. just white. Yeah. Um, and yet I've bred my best birds off of those hens. Um, but whether there's a long term problem I'm going to come up against, I don't know yet. We'll have to wait yeah. and see. I, I tend to, because at the moment I've got, because I'm, I'm kind of breeding, in my bottom half of the trolley cage, I've got all the hens that are old enough to breed off. Um, and then in the top, I've got a mixture of cocks and a load of babies. Um, every, so every every week or two, I'll put two or three cock birds from that flight in with the hens. And, let and, and within, a, within five minutes, you can tell which hens want to breed. Yeah. Um, and then, like I say, if, if it's one of those big, ugly, rough ones, it's, it's, 
suddenly becoming more active than normal, it's, it's time to breed off them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I do much the same. Um, I mean, I've even tried um, putting a show cage with a cock bird in, in a flight as well and let the hens come yeah. to the cock. Um, and, that, and that tells you all you need to know sometimes. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. Um, now, so I suppose something we haven't spoken, we, we talk about you pairing visually and all the rest of it, but do you ever take into account different feather types? You know, we talk about a long feather, a broad feather. Yeah. So have you found you build birds quicker and better with using feather genetics, if you want? Yeah, so so when I, I say we pair visually, we, ne we never pair, very rarely do we pair two birds with the same feather together. Um, do, you, do, you, do you pull a feather out to look? We, or do you just quite, look? Yeah, quite often we do. Yeah, we, we, but to be honest, you can see it. Most of the time you can see it, in, you know, the spot is a classic, isn't it? Yeah. You know, if a bird's got tiny spots, it's got a narrow feather, hasn't it? So yeah. it, it's it's quite easy to see. Um, and I, I, we don't like really pairing the, the rough to the rough. Um, again, because, you know, we're in it for this. We want to breed a show bird. Show bird. So yeah. Although you might uh, progress stock-wise quite quickly doing that, it's then more to bring back to style up, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, I, I, I pair all the, you know, the ugly hens to the stylish cocks and vice versa. And then yeah. in, in between go to, can go to either extreme and extremities, really, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, don't, we yeah. don't have that many fine feathered birds as such. But, well, the ones that we don't want to keep are obviously are, are normally the fine feathered birds. Yeah. Um, and we don't have many, we don't breed from many of those. Um, sometimes um, if we've paired up a super pair and they've bred it like a, a hen that you think, oh, it's, it's, it's okay, it's decent, but it's not, it's not going to set the world on fire. Sometimes we'll keep them back and breed from them, knowing what they're off. Yeah. Um, we, we don't really do it with the cockbirds. I made that mistake a couple of years ago and didn't keep enough finer feathered hens and ended up breeding things like this big Mr. Big Blue who I put on Facebook this week, you know. And, and I really struggled to find a hen to, to sort of, A, get him going and B, bring him back a little bit because I mm. certainly don't want to take him any further. You know, it's like having a cockatiel in the flipping shed. Yeah, um, it's enormous, but uh, no, it, it's feather. Feather is feather is something you either. I, I think you either understand it or you don't. If that makes sense, and I'm. I guess you can teach people, and and the, to teach people to look at the spots and that is is quite good. Um, but I still think sometimes we miss what we're trying to do with feather. You know, um, yeah. Well, ultimately, you know, for for the perfect show where we're looking at a medium a medium feather. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you can breed the perfect show bird by having a stud just full of medium feathered birds. Definitely not. I think you know you need you need the mixture. Yeah. Um, you, you, need the, you, know, you need the over the top whacking great big heads. You need the big bodies. You need the you know you need it. Yeah. Some with like. We had an opening grey a few years ago, and its spots were huge on it, and it it, it looked extreme in terms of like its spots looked too big for it for the bird. Yeah. Um, but pair it to a you know a, a line with no spots or little spot, and you you're not looking for that big spot. You're looking for somewhere in between the two. In between. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, a, a question that I always ask is where do you stand on artificial insemination? Um, I don't. I don't really see the point in it. Um, I, well, I, I guess if if you were in it short term and we're, we're trying to breed super birds really quick, I guess it could work. I've never. I don't know. I've never tried it. Is the honest answer. I don't know. No. Um, no. I mean, it, it was funny because somebody the other day. Um, you know, if, if said to me, well, if I had a super bird that had a broken leg, you know, it's yeah. not that bird's fault necessarily. Um, they would do it that way, you know. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, 
well, ultimately, I think, you know, I, I'd like to think that in 20, 30 years' time, if I'm still breeding, if I'm still breeding budgies, that they can still breed themselves without me having to do anything. Definitely. You know, yeah. that's, I know, I know the further we take the birds, you know, they are getting harder to breed from the better birds. You know, longevity is getting um, yeah. shorter. We, we, you know, we know that. Um, and I don't think AI in birds would would benefit that. It, it'd make it worse. And also, you you get a very close stud very quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, and it only takes if you you know if, if you bred a super super I don't know spangle cock tomorrow, way above anything else you bred. And you think, well, I'm going to AI that with AI that with 15 different hens this year. What's to say that super spangle doesn't hold like fits and things like that in its genetics or? Yeah. Or other genes that you you don't see visually that year, yeah. but and then you've put it through your whole stud in one year. That's right. It's, you know, you know, you take five steps forwards, but you're going to come back ten, aren't you? It's, yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know. To be honest, it's it's a tricky one because you 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 can't. No one can police it. No one would admit in the UK that they do it, but some people, I guess, do. But I've I've never visited a stud that does it, so I don't. I can't say yes, it's good or yes, it's not good because I've never seen it, you know, no. the outcome of it. No, that's right. Um, I know, okay, you know so they do it with cattle, don't they? But then they only have one bull and 50 cows. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, but right. they can't keep 100 bulls and 100 cows. So No, that's yeah. right. Okay, so um, just a little bit on medication now. So do you routinely treat your birds? Um, and does your dad do the same? We both do the um, exact same. Um, so we, for years, we, well, I say years, once a year we were treating with Megabuck S, um, which you can't get a hold of it anymore. New, we've still got some in stock because um, we bought a, quite a lot of it. <laughs> um, oh, right. Yeah. Um, only because only a, lot, a lot of the time if we're going abroad, it, it shipping is the cost. Yeah. Um, so you might as well buy, you know, two or three pots or something if the, you know, the expiry date's good on it rather than just yeah. one pot. Um, so we will look for an alternative to that. Um, and I think we've got, I, I reckon we've got enough to treat this year's when we stop breeding this summer yeah. with, with Megabuck S. And then we'll have to look at something like a sodium benzylate or something like that. Um, yeah, I've never, we've yeah. never, ne neither of us have used it before. So it's something that we'd, um, yeah, I'd, I'd, okay. I'd probably test run it on some sales birds. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't do the stud with it. No, without I was, I was the same. Um, I was saying when I was having a lot of problems, um, it wasn't benzoate I used. I actually used um, hydrogen peroxide um, for thirty days. Very, very dilute, but for thirty days, um, and I did a batch. And for 30 days, they were fine. Mm. Um, so I did the entire time. At the time, I had nothing to lose because I had yeah. so many problems. Um, it wasn't the end of my problems, but it's certainly long, a long way. Um, but yeah, talking to Kevin, I um, mean, he's done the papers um, on the UKBC website and everything. Um, so that, that you know, it's there with the dosage and everything. So um, because I believe it can be overdosed if you're not careful. Yeah, I, th I think it's easy to. Well, I think for many years, a lot of a lot of the budget breeders were underdosing things. Um, yeah. Until kind of Kevin's come out with proper kind of fact sheets and kind of proper um, scientific information and you know results of how how much of X product you know the main active ingredient you need for budget. Right. So I think a lot of the time in the past, and we've probably done it where we think we've been treated for something for fifteen days. But in reality, we haven't put, a bin, put enough in the water. So you've had the same issue a month later and you think, well, why have I got that issue? I treated for that, but you kind of didn't. Well, I, I, was, I was brought up by, the, by a pigeon. My dad's had pigeons all his life, racing pigeons. And um, it was always, um, well, there's that half the dose, mm. you know, because it's a pigeon, but you're feeding the budgie. Well, actually, the active ingredient was exactly the same, turns mm. out, for the budgies as it was a... Bit, yeah, but you know, at the time we didn't know you would get. Yeah, some. so yeah, we we treat for Megaback um, once a year when we're not ideally when we're not breeding. Um, purely, one of the reasons for that is um, when we're breeding, we've got a lot of drinkers to fill up, so you'd end up using 
tons yeah, of product. Whereas yeah. when it's in a few a few drinkers in the flight, you know, you know, X flight will drink X amount of out of a drinker in a day. So you only put up put in what they're going to drink in effect. Um, we treat with um, for trike as well every three months. Is that um, Ronovit S? It, it was Ronovit S, but now I use. Um, Oh, you're using the DAC one. I use a DAC one, yeah, 20%, yeah, that's right. 20% yeah. one. Um, and Dad's just started using that one as well because he's read out of Ronnie Bit S. No, nothing against Ronnie Bit S, worked really well. Um, it's just it's just the same active ingredient, stronger and cheaper. Yeah. What it yeah. comes down to. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got a lot of budgies. It, it costs money to medicate them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we treat for that every three months, regardless of whether we're breeding or not. Um, and both studs get done within a couple of weeks with each other. Yeah. Um, so if I bring if I bring a bird to dad's, I know that in say January, I'd have treated for it and dad's treated for it in January. Yeah. So it, 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 it doesn't so nothing misses misses out if that, that makes sense. And do you do you, um do mite and worm treatment? Yeah, we do um, uh, cyadectin in the water. Oh right. Really? Um, two days, or well, I do two days or three days a month. Um, you know, two days, three days following each other. Um, every month, we haven't had mite problems for years. We had uh, we bought in a bird in two thousand six, which had a bit of an issue with mites. Um, since then, we've we've we're, we're um, uh, with mite, it's routine. Sort yeah. your routine out. Mite shouldn't be a problem. No. Um, it's when, it's we, when you think you've got rid of it, isn't it? And then you think, yeah. oh, so I've got rid of it and I'll stop now. Yeah, um, so, um, you know, we ivermectin every bird that comes through the door. Um, and that goes in a separate cage for a couple of weeks. Um, we ivermectin all the birds when we ring them. Um, we have diatoms in underneath all the um, trays in the cages. Yeah. Um, we put diatoms under the newspaper in the cages. It goes under the bedding material in the flight. It goes um, under the concaves. It goes on in the sawdust mix in the in the nest box. A little bit of diatom powder. Um, so yeah, we put cyadectin in the water for two to three days. We spray and fog sometimes with like once a month, every two months with AIL from Better yep. Farm. That brilliant brilliant project uh, product. Yeah. Uh, we miss the birds with that as well. So when we fog, we'll do the birds, we'll do the environment, everything. Um, was it was it yourself and your dad that used to dip every Yeah, day? yeah, we, we yeah. do that because we bought we bought in a bird. And we did stupidly. We didn't treat it. We just put it in a breeding cage on its own, next to our other birds that were breeding. And then within about I don't know a week and a half, it was pulling its wing feathers out, and they were all like twisted and curled up. And we, you know, we were straightening them in the kettle every day. And after a few days, I thought it's, it's got to have something going on. So anyway, I, I brought a microscope thing from work, and then it was. Yeah, it was basically riddled with feather lice. Yeah. Um, so as a consequence, we were like, shit, we're in the middle of a breeding season. We've got 50 pair, I think, down at the time. And I, you know, I, I went and caught random birds up, and there was mite on or lice, not in the same numbers, but virtually every bird I caught up had lice on it. Yeah. Um so we bought in this one bird and it just it just spread really quickly. So we the yeah. the we thought we came up with this plan was we thought, well, it's it's kind of March time, was it April time? The weather's okay. First thing in the morning, we'll both go in there and we'll dunk every single bird. Yeah. Um just to knock it with then we know we've knocked it out. So even the hens on eggs, got them out of the nest box, dunked them back on the and um to be honest, I think there was one hen that went off its eggs for an hour or two and then it was fine after that kind of thing yeah but we, we to be honest we couldn't afford to think oh we'll treat the non-breeding birds and leave the breeding birds 
we no. were like, it doesn't make sense. So we, we dumped them and I ever met them at the same time. Yeah. Um, and then and then and that also that's when we started the fogging regime of the monthly fog. Yeah. Um and then yeah, and now you know, every time I go back to dad's, I take up a um it's like a hand lens with a light in it. Uh, oh, yeah. it magnifies. I take that home, I take that back with me. I've got one in here. Um, and I'll catch random birds up and we'll, I'll look for my, and I'm, we haven't found any for a long time. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So like I say, it's, it's because we're doing all these routine things all the time. Yeah. Um, so it, it can't, it can't get a grip. No, I must admit that AIL is, is probably the best single product out there for washing and dipping, but it is so expensive. And, and of course with them, and then we went through the time where we couldn't get any. Yeah, it's ex it's expensive, but it's how, how it expensive works. It's that, that's the thing. We tried, yeah. you know, we tried loads of products over the years, um, but nothing is is as effective. So, but now I think we, I guess we get around it now by we use less because we put it through the fogger. Yeah. So yeah, you, that, that you know, we only really use funny. fifty mil at a time, and we'll do Dad's bird room, and and you you know, you'll have jetted every single bird, every nook, every cranny, yeah. with that kind of liter of of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, just a straight spray like I use. I I do tend to go through it quite quickly. Yeah, if you if you put it for a hand spray, it, it you know, it's like turning yeah. on a tap; it just uses it, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. Well, are you okay for time? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Um, so, okay, so we've already said that one. Okay, so we'll, we'll let's have a chat about clubs because obviously we're both um, involved in the UKBC. Um, and, you know, what's your thoughts on um, how we progressed as the UKBC? You know, is it heading in the right direction? I, I think it's kind of a breath of fresh air, to be honest. Um, I, I think a lot of clubs need to change some of their ideas about how they do things. Yeah. Um, and, and I always remember I used to go to clubs when I was like 14, 15 with my dad. And you'd sit there listening and they were discussing like the minutes from the previous meeting for half the night. And it's like, it, it's, it's not, need, you know what I mean? It's not needed. It, it needs to be more engaging. Um, we need to try and get more younger people in the hobby. We need to try and get a different mix of people in the hobby. We need to get the, a lot of things about the hobby are kind of, oh, we do it like this, we've always done it like this kind of mentality. Um, except the actual bird itself that's the only thing really that's changed in the, in the hobby isn't it really yeah yeah, it um, is. yeah i mean i think sometimes i find that the champions have have almost talked about it so much that they feel that they're doing the same thing over and over again not necessarily to the same people but you know and, and i think you know, I'm on one of the Facebook pages, and and if I type heavy mix and liquid once a day, I type I type it ten times a day. It, it it's the education side of it mm. is so key. It's so key. You know, I I think really the the budgie hobby in general has been really slow off the mark with bird health, yeah. um, and also and when I say bird health, I mean simple things like. Um, the quality of air in the bedroom. Yeah. You know, so many people have, have left budgies because they can't, you know, it's, it's adverse to their health. Yeah. You know, so you've got a hobby you love, in effect, it's slowly killing you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, pigeon people have known about dust and the, and the consequences of dust for years, haven't they? That's right. Um, but it's yeah. only, I don't know, maybe in the last 10 years, if that, or if that, thought, that people have, yeah. have, you know, I remember when we um, we designed our first bird room, huge, great brick building. It had like a, um, you know, what would be a bathroom extractor fan, like a four inch little <laughs> yeah. thing in it. And it's like, 
you know, you stood at the other side of it, you could hardly feel the thing blowing it, you know, it couldn't blow a draft if it wanted to. No. Um, so, our, you know, our, our, our birds, you know, we've been slow, we've been really slow off the mark with that. Yeah. Um, you know, we I think we've got it a lot better now. I've got a system here that I'm really happy with. We've done dads. He's really happy with that. We've, we're not saying we're dust free, but we're a lot less dust, I think, in the air, which is, yeah. more, this is more important. Because, um, yeah. you know, it, we're breathing it in. The birds are constantly breathing it in. It can't be good for them. No, um, that's right. And, and, we all, and we're all the same, but we all keep more birds than we should. Um, so as a consequence, we have more dust, more husk, more potential yeah. for disease and viruses. And when it goes wrong, it will, it will go wrong quickly. Um, yeah. So I, I think... Going back to your question about UKBC, I think it's been a breath of fresh air bird health wise, definitely. Um, yeah. Having someone like Kevin, who let's you know he's a budgie breeder, isn't he? You yeah. know, having a budgie breeder who is a top vet. Yeah, it's, you, it's you, like can't, you, can't, you can't get better, can you? No, you know what I mean. No. You, you can't, you can't do better than that. No. Um, and the fact that he's giving up his own time to come up with, you know, he could think, oh, I'm a top, you know, I'm a top vet, I'm a budget breeder. I'm going to keep all my secrets to myself, yeah. you know, and I'm not, I'm going to treat me this, this and this, but I'm not going to tell people what I'm using. No, that's um, you know, but he's, you know, he's doing, he's doing some brilliant kind of fact sheets, talks. Um, and, you know, you know, we've been in, I've been in budgets for a long, you know, I'm 42 now. And I think, I've been in Budgie since I was about 16 or 15, something like that. So, it's, you know, it's a long time. And Budgie health has never, ever been no. anywhere. You know, there used to be um, the BS did that diagnostic scheme with Dr. Baker years ago, yeah. didn't they? But it was no, it was, we used the scheme and, the, you know. It was, well, it, well, the way I looked at that was it was already too late because it was dead. It, or, yeah, it was. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it 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 was just a case of doing something. It was better than nothing, but it. Yeah. it I, I my you know my personal opinion, having used the service quite a few times, was it was as good as nothing really. Um, and I think the fact that Kevin breeds birds and has bred many different type of bird, I think it, it it's it, he he understands. How, you know, like it's okay to think, oh, I'm a vet. Um, in in a, in a laboratory, I could treat two birds for this because my environment's sterile. They're not going to pick up this, this, and this. But in reality, if you've got 300 birds, yeah, you need to come up with a way of if one bird's got a disease, stopping that going through the 300 birds. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I, I think health health wise, brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah. The lectures um, as they as they come through, I've been watching all of those so far. Again, it just gets you thinking about yes, I'm doing this right, or actually, why why am I doing that? It doesn't doesn't make any sense when you actually think about it. No, that's right. Um, I mean, one of his best sentences, you know, why are you adding that to your diet? What are you actually trying to achieve? Mm. And, and it really does make you stop and think. You know, um, I mean, I've seen. I mean, I've always said it. I'm, I mean, I'm involved with the committee side of things as well now. Um, is is we've missed for years the hobbyist, the aviaryist, the aviary keepers, and, and even the pet birds. You know, Mrs. Smith with Joey in a cage. You know, and and I mean, some people say to me, you know, why on earth do you keep pushing Avimix and liquid iodine? Because a top vet told me. And I've seen the results, mm. you know, years of just seed and cuttlefish, you know, might have been OK. Because what we're finding now is the exhibition cast offs are ending up as our pet birds. Mm. So they're not the little tiny joeys yeah. from Australia type thing now. They are, if you want, a beginner exhibition bird, you know, so, and, and they're, they're becoming the pets. So they are taking that little bit more feather and everything, even, you know, yeah. to little Joey. So, you know, it, it really was a big eye opener, you know, um, you know, when I went, well, once I took the leap to join Facebook, because I was very reluctant, 
um, at the start, but my goodness yeah. me, it, it really. I think I think also you know not a criticism against the BS, but it has it has only focused on the exhibition side of things. Yeah. Um, you know that is its focus. Um, yeah. So the the kind of individual pet breeder who has one bird, why would you join the BS? You know, if you've got an aviary at home and you just want some colour birds to breed, there's no reason to join the BS. No, that's um, right. Which is a shame because there should be a reason to join the BS if you're a budgie breeder. Um, so I think I think there's a lot of, a lot of things need to change. Um, you know, because the hobby, I, I guess the hobby BS wise, is probably smaller now than it's ever been. Yeah. Um, which is really sad because, like I said, I still want to be going in 30 years' time. Um, yeah. I'm thinking, you know, if I if I looked at however many members there are, and you think, well, the age brackets of some of these people, yeah. In ten years' time, how many of those two thousand, unfortunately, are going to not no longer be with us? Yeah. That's and right. is is that number going to be replaced by juniors coming through and people who packed up, start restarting again, that kind of thing? You know, there's got yeah. to be there's got to be more of a way of getting people into yeah. the hobby and, and knowing about the hobby. Yeah. Well, I think I think the UK BC have, have definitely, uh, and we are certainly trying to fill that gap. So, you know, as long as we and we're not, we're not about just exhibition birds. Mm. You know, the, the pool of people that hopefully will join is massive. Mm. You know, from Joey in the cage to the Avery at the bottom to the person yeah. that then goes, cool, I quite like those exhibitions, you know. Um, you know, your hobby breeder is your next well, the whole exhibition. The whole thing is about, you know, is about educating. You know, if someone buys a pet bird, Nine times out of ten, they've no idea what to feed it. They go to the pet shop. The pet shop's got no idea how to feed it. No. The bird might live a while. It might not. Yeah. So having a, a like an online resource like Kevin, it, it's brilliant for it. You know, whether you got one bird or five hundred, to be honest, it's it, it's it's there, isn't it? If you ask a question, send a video, whatever. That's right. It, it's there. So yeah. it, it's got to be. You know, the less birds dying because of things we're doing to them in terms of or not breeding, doing you know, disease, yeah. things like that, yeah. the better, isn't it? It's got to be good yeah, for the hobby. Definitely. It's gotta be. Definitely. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I think I think that's about all my questions, to be honest. Okay. There's lots of others I've slipped in. Um, yeah, so I can't thank you enough. Um, there'll be lots more of these coming. Um, and uh, I'm even going to try and get some of the Avery keepers and the hobbyists to do similar mm -hmm. as well. And hopefully now I can get back out. I can go and do some location visits and things as well. So, yeah. So from everybody at the UKBC, thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, keep posting those lovely birds. Gives us something to aim for. Thank you. <laughs> thank you All very right. much. Thanks very much, mate. Speak to you soon. See you soon. Bye.